to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Stephen S. Cohen, who is professor in the Graduate School at the University of California at Berkeley, and he's also co-director of the Berkeley Roundtable on the International Economy, also at Berkeley. He's a senior fellow at the New America Foundation in Washington, and he's just written with uh, Brad DeLong, The End of Influence, What Happens When Other Countries Have the Money. Steve, welcome to our program. Good to be here with you, Harry. Where were you born and raised? New York. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? They kind of applauded if you were reasonable and realistic. And didn't think, or weren't all that impressed if you could cite the great religious authorities. <laughs> <laughs> and was there a lot of discussion about politics and the economy around the dinner table, or did that come later? That came later. And what, what got you interested in, in uh, pursuing uh, degrees in the field of politics and economics? Well, I was an undergraduate. Where did you do your undergraduate? Williams College. Aha. Uh -huh. For young boys of good family at the time. They subsequently now have women there. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a major in political science and economics. And I couldn't tell him. I didn't know where one ended and the other began. I've had a lifelong difficulty. Is this economics? Is this politics? So I kind of did both. Mm -hmm. And then from, from there, you went on to graduate school in? Oh, there was a little interruption. I was um, too early as an undergraduate editor of the college magazine. Mm -hmm. The dean called me into his office and said, I'm giving you a choice. A, you're out of here today. I'm throwing you out. Mm -hmm. Well, B, you stop editing that thing mm -hmm. and go take a junior year abroad. And I said, Paris. He said, done. And, and what, what was he objecting to? A particular oh, article? Oh, yes. Or the general <laughs> tone uh, of? Uh... First, there was the tone. And then there was a particular piece. Mm -hmm. um, looking back, it was kind of obnoxious. <laughs> it was about some poor guy there who taught a course on religion, sex and love in the Bible, among other things, and was up to be president of a small college nearby. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a little limerick. I see. So uh, it was off to Paris. Jointly signed with the daughter of the chairman of the board of trustees of that college, who mm -hmm. was an undergraduate at Smith at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, for that, you should be tossed. I mean, it was just awful. I see. So, so did you get more discipline in, in uh, uh, Paris, or was it rather you were exposed to the culture and I don't stayed think with it, it? I don't think it was more about discipline so much as exposure to the world. Mm -hmm. And of all places to think about an economy, France um, never accepted the kind of economics we mainstream here. Mm -hmm. The difference between the government and the private didn't make sense to anybody. Mm -hmm. That the government was the referee. No, the government is the partner of everything and everyone. <coughs> so, so the state, uh, not the government. Did, 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 did that experience give you a focus so that you now really kind of had a sense of, of what you wanted to do? Well, regularly? it didn't give me any focus. I really had a great time. <laughs> I see. Okay. So much to see and do and learn. You had to mm -hmm. learn about eating. You had to learn about art. It was just endless. Mm -hmm. And um, when I got back, this one professor called me and said, and what was your project? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, mom, 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 oh, yeah. Um, I, I started looking at um, French economic planning. I see. So he said, very good, write a paper about mm -hmm. it. So I did. Um, and then I went off to graduate school. First, I applied to law school a few times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Um, the Harvard Law School has that catalog, the, the Facebook, mm -hmm. <laughs> the pictures of the incoming class. If you look under Cohen, not only Cohen, Steve Cohen, because a few of it, there's one photo missing. <laughs> that was me. Yeah, I see. So you and got accepted but didn't go. I actually wrote a 
stupid letter. You know, stay a wise guy, kid. You know, I look upon uh, entering the Harvard Law School as a symbol of my own total defeat in life. <laughs> I see. I see. And I. And they didn't take kindly to that, I guess. Oh, they care a lot. Yeah, I see. I'm sure they were not in the least bit disturbed. Mm -hmm. And because um, I applied the year after, and they admitted me again, and I didn't go again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I went to the London School. And and focusing on. Well, uh, politics and the economy. I yeah. did it. Yeah. And they had a, you might call it a program where you could do both. Mm -hmm. So I did, and I ended up doing a thesis on? French planning. French economic planning. You see, you, the littlest, they stick to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and what, what, what was it, just to be clear about this, what was it? that led to this focus, you think, that experience, junior year abroad, and, the, and then you found this whole interface between the two realms uh, very it significant? It sounds so noble. <laughs> it was that experience and the need that afternoon to have a subject for that professor mm -hmm. in, in, one, in, one, in, in, in half an hour. So I, there, I had a so I yeah. kept going. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, in those days, a thesis at LSE was, well, the idea was you'd write a book. Mm -hmm. Not a, an article or two articles that mm -hmm. shows you can play the, do all the necessary um, tricks. Mm -hmm. No, you wrote a book. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this book, and it came out uh, at Harvard Press called Modern Capitalist Planning or something like that. I actually have it. Modern Capitalist Planning, the French model. The French model, yeah. right. And, and it, it, what, what did you learn in, in the writing of that book and, and, and all the research entailed. I mean, did, did it raise, your, raise you to a new level in seeing this interface? Well, at first, it was all about the interface. Yeah. The state, business, the economy. And where it's all seen as one. Mm -hmm. And I started looking around the world and countries making important changes, rapid growth, changes in their where they go, Japan. Um, and you see the enormous role of policy, of the actions of the state, in steering it, in enabling it. And that, you know, in a funny way, set me up for an understanding of Japan. Mm -hmm. When there used to be those big arguments. There was no argument Japan was doing well. Mm -hmm. This would be now in, in the 80s. And no, the 70s and the, and the 80s, 80s yeah. 70s and yeah. 80s. Uh, Japan was definitely doing mm -hmm. well. This mm -hmm. was unquestionable, fabulously. And um, there was a whole, I'd say a majority of American economists saying, well, the, the, the state's too involved. They, they should get out of everything. Mm -hmm. And no one in Japan thought this made any sense whatsoever. No, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And it was easier for me to understand what the Japanese thought they were doing, because I thought of it in French, mm -hmm. <laughs> as opposed to thinking of it in Anglo-Saxon, as mm -hmm. the French would call it. Right. Um, and that kind of carried through in most things I have done. Mm -hmm. Now, this raises an interesting question, because what, what we've learned here is that, that you wound up going abroad to see this connection. And, and that turned you, uh, in essence, in to a political economist, yeah. I guess one would say, which is not something that grows naturally uh, in the American environment. No, you find us under glass in a few museums. <laughs> I they, see. They don't have that. We don't do well, that. You're, you're brought out uh, from under the glass when, when there's a crisis in the system, which, which leads us kind of. And we have crises uh, rather frequently yeah, in right. economics. Now, now, so let's say that, that students want to figure out how to develop the skills to do this. How, how do you prepare? What is it you, you have to learn in the way of a skill set to do po the political economics well? You have to first learn to be marginalized. <laughs> so to see live with being an outsider. Normal right? career paths closed. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, no, no kidding around. Right. It's a closed shop in economics, really. Mm -hmm. You don't do it. If you can't make an econometric model, you can't utter it. Mm -hmm. um, 
And you can make very powerful econometric models at the expense of what you talk about. Mm -hmm. Has to be small, and it's built on a set of assumptions. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, uh, and this is something I wanted to talk about. It is in comparing what you do to what the an economist in the economics profession. The, the, you're, you're saying there's a there's a, a kind of narrowness of the focus and a a uh, uh, a uh, uh, an awe at the elegance of the theory, which may or may not relate to what's actually going on in the real world. Oh, definitely. Yeah. In fact, I don't believe as a requirement for a PhD in most of the top economics departments. You were asked to know anything about economic, the history of economic thought, mm -hmm. or about economic history. Mm -hmm. what, what has happened out mm -hmm. there? In the, and I think that's an egregious loss. And also politics, right? I mean, it isn't there. They don't do politics. Yeah, yeah. The assumption is. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, in a way, a flaw here is that uh, uh, the, the, there is a disconnect which leads to a lack of understanding of kind of the institutional setting, the politics of the setting in which a particular paradigm is embraced. Yeah. Or viewed another way, as an economist said, there's a trade-off mm -hmm. for the power of your analysis you sacrifice its relevance and its range. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes that comes around to bite you badly. And, and I, I think <clears throat> we've already learned from you that in, in your particular case, your analysis of France contributed uh, 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 to the power of your analysis of Japan when that became an important issue, that is the rise of the Japanese economy. So what I'm hearing you say is comparative studies uh, uh, become very important. That is comparing, comparing case studies. It absolutely helps to know mm -hmm. something about what's going on over there, mm -hmm. especially when they interact. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you are a co-founder and a co-director of the Berkeley Roundtable uh, on the International Economy. Which brie, like the cheese. Br brie, like the cheese. Of course, it would have to be because of that junior year. I mean, I'm, that was one yeah, of the most first. Most of those years as a grad student. Also. <laughs> right. So, so what, what then, and, and talk a little about that, uh, that group here at Berkeley because it, it became... Uh, important for the campus and internationally in sort of understanding the trends in the world where political economy was really important as we became less competitive and the rest of the world became, or some parts of it, became more competitive. Well, that's another one of these things that, you know, life's about a certain amount of the accidental. Mm -hmm. I had spent two years in New York previously sabbatical and some other, I don't remember what, some fellowship. <clears throat> and um, most of it I spent hanging around the Institute for Humanities at NYU, mm -hmm. where they gave me this marvelous office, and there were some interesting people. Ray, did you read a lot of novels, or what? Uh... Uh, the novels were the nice part of it. So yeah, the rest okay, was okay. The, the studies of the studies that criticized the studies of the mm -hmm. novels were mm -hmm. a little not my favorite. Um, but I came back. When I got back, I said, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And it seems, what do we have here? The great outdoors. Mm -hmm. California, you mean? Yeah. yeah. I'm not too good at that. Mm -hmm. Then there were strange and exotic sexual practices at the time. Well, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I looked out with an absolutely lovely and beautiful wife. So, I, you know, I wasn't going to be good at it anyway. So that left technology, mm -hmm. which I knew nothing. Mm -hmm. It was fun to learn a little. And semiconductors go into everything, mm -hmm. everything. So all of a sudden, if you follow the chip, you get wherever you want to go. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, around 1982. So I met up with uh, John Zeisman in political science here, and very shortly thereafter with Laura Tyson in economics. And we said, well, let's work together. Mm -hmm. So we didn't found an institute. We said, let's actually work together. Mm -hmm. um, we get some outside dough, and we co-run it. We don't need 
a great stamp of approval mm -hmm. from the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. We just cooperate, mm -hmm. which is unusual on a campus, <laughs> exceedingly so. And that has held for all oh, these 25 mm -hmm. years and change, more. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and we started, well, what was really going on was the, <clears throat> the Japanese challenge <clears throat> to the United States in advanced technology, as well as in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So out of that came an early book I did with John Zeisman called Manufacturing Matters, where we argued it is a poor idea for a great big nation, not for a little specialized mm -hmm. place, Luxembourg, <laughs> mm -hmm. London, no, for a big, uh, to lose its advantages in manufacturing. And, and that, that was kind of the beginning of the cycle where we were doing less and less manufacturing, which actually becomes an important element in mm -hmm. your new book. Yeah. And we, you know, one of the keys was um, a lot of Japanese firms were terrific, Canon, you know, but there was a heavy role of the Japanese government pushing this. Mm -hmm. And our argument was, you know, this is the way it's being played, so maybe we ought to play it intelligently in these terms. Mm -hmm. We didn't. The United States, you no, mean? We yeah. Didn't. No, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's now move to your book, because a lot of these uh, themes we've been talking about come together here. Let me show it one more time. The end of influence, uh, what happens when other countries have the money. So why did you and, and Brad DeLong write this book? Well, again, it started less deliberate. I find much of my life is... Uh, <laughs> lacking in a certain amount of strategic planning, that we were going to do a piece on um, sovereign wealth funds. The rise of these enormous tills. Pots of, of money. Huge. <clears throat> that are controlled by, we should by explain. the government. Right. Directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. But government controlled large amounts of money. It's a little different than what had been previously the case. And the model for all of these has always been multi-exemplary Norway. Mm -hmm. Norway good. Mm -hmm. Norway's Kuwait done right. Mm -hmm. Because Norway had uh, oil. So, uh, oil, and, oil money and, piling up, yep. and they learned something. Mm -hmm. If you just dished it out to everyone in Norway, you were going to have an inflation. Mm -hmm. You were going to make all your man your, your currency would go way up. All your normal business would be um, destroyed in terms of competitive, and you have a mess. This used to be called the Dutch disease. Mm -hmm. Because the Dutch had gone through this experience in the 60s. They had some oil. They generated a lot of money, and they blew it all away. It um, did them no good, mm -hmm. the opposite. So the Norwegians simply said, we're putting it all in a bank account offshore. Because mm -hmm. you bring it onshore, it raises the... And we'll live on the interest. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the money is in another currency, the dollar in this case? It's invested abroad, abroad. in okay. other currencies. Okay. Overwhelmingly, you know, large well, portion in dollars, dollars. and okay. all over. And they invest it the way the California retirement system does. Mm -hmm. People, uh, you know, they don't own more than one or two percent of most com and what they invest in. They have some political things. No bomb makers, I think no cigarette makers. You know, they're good, right. good, good, good. Good Scandinavian good, good, principle. Good, good, yes. good, good Norway. Yeah. Now, if all the investment funds were like this, it'd be not at all, mm -hmm. certainly not even a problem, not even a question. Mm -hmm. They're not. Mm -hmm. um, you have a very large uh, Russian mm -hmm. sovereign wealth fund. Mm -hmm. now, from oil also. Yeah, yeah, from oil. Mo they're, Two, two, two sources of these. Mm -hmm. There's the, the mineral, the oil, mm -hmm. which are a bunch of the you know, Persian Gulf and oil countries, and Russia in a big way. And then there are the Chinese manufacturers, the, the Asian manufacturers, mm -hmm. exemplary uh, China, mm -hmm. um, which has you know, north of $2,000 billion dollars. in dollars. Yeah, mm -hmm. say, 
Yeah, about that. North of two trillion in dollars sitting there in various tills. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a sovereign wealth fund, mm -hmm. but under direct and indirect government control. Mm -hmm. How do you use it? Well, if you were the Chinese government, mm -hmm. you'd try and use it strategically. I mean, one thing is you just put it out there and earn a return and be blind for index funds. Mm -hmm. um, Another is you say, well, our mission here on Earth mm -hmm. is to um, advance the Chinese economy. Well, we got this enormous tool here. Mm -hmm. What do we do with it? Well, what we need, we could use some technology. Well, mm -hmm. this may help us get it. Mm -hmm. And so we were raising some of these questions. Ooh, come to think of it, it might be political. Mm -hmm. If that president of the United States, whatever his name is, Mm -hmm. makes no difference, starts doing things that uh, we don't like, mm -hmm. that hurt us, mm -hmm. that irk us. Mm -hmm. What if the limousine that brings the Chinese bankers to New York to buy the U.S. debt every Thursday morning mm -hmm. has a flat tire? Mm -hmm. In fact, what if we announce in advance we're going to have a flat tire mm -hmm. and not show? That might send the, the market down a thousand points. That, that president may, maybe he has to think about us before opening his big mouth. Mm -hmm. This is a change. Is this not a change? Yeah. So, so in, in essence, that what, what came about uh, as the sovereign funds developed, especially in the case of the Chinese, was uh, really a change in, in the power balance between the two countries, beginning in the economic realm. And this is a, a major unexpected disturbance if you buy into what you call the neoliberal view of the world, which was the doctrine, the policy that the United States had embraced uh, uh, several decades ago. Uh, so the book moves toward a, a look, uh, essentially it's, it's the epitaph of the neoliberal paradigm for domestic policy in the United States. Because I hope th so. that policy produced this very great disturbance, which we'll talk about again in a minute, the sovereign funds. Uh, several other big disturbances. Yes. So, yes, I, I think it's uh, been pretty unfortunate for America. So, so what is the neoliberal paradigm? It's really simple. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Leave it to the market. Okay. Get the fat, stupid, bureaucratic hands of the state out. Mm -hmm. Deregulate. Mm -hmm. And play this out. Mm -hmm. And everything will spin around and work out fine. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a lot of problems with this. Sometimes it doesn't. That's called macroeconomics, mm -hmm. Keynes. But also, what if the other guys are not doing it? Mm -hmm. That may even make believe, which I don't believe for a minute, that this is the best way to do it for a country. Mm -hmm. But what about the other countries? Mm -hmm. So if you're playing touch football, and the other guy's got a helmet and shoulder plaids, mm -hmm. maybe this is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, the, there is a strategic element. And that's sometimes absent in such thinking. Um, it, you know, a whole bunch of things came together. Um, one was, I start with a long argument in this book that way, income distribution. Mm -hmm. The period, I don't know, 1947, when the dust settled from the war, up into the mid-70s, the American economy more or less doubled. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, GDP per capita. And the guy, the 50-yard line, the guy in the exact median mm -hmm. income district, he doubled also. Mm -hmm. And the guy in the top 10%, he doubled also. Mm -hmm. So we went with an unchanging equal income district. The ranks didn't change mm -hmm. for, a, for the great generation. So, so we maintain prosperity. We move forward from, say, the 30 years after World War II uh, and everybody was gaining together. Equally. Equally, yeah. And those were the great 
that was the great American dream. Mm -hmm. And we were gaining even bigger than the numbers indicated because you, know, you had television and washing machines and mm -hmm. you know, price in the, the, the deflators are not, don't explain what really, you had like penicillin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, and that lowers the cost. So, mm -hmm. you know, this doesn't tell you how good it was. Yeah. Um, for the next 25, 30 years. Beginning, say, in about 74. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. the mid 70s. Because yeah. I, I, I don't have my numbers yeah. in front of yeah, me. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to get hung on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we grew a bit slower, mm -hmm. but we grew. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, about three quarters increase over the period till now-ish. And um, roughly speaking, all the gain went to the top 10%. Mm -hmm. The middle guy gained way under 1% per year. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the counting is not so clear. And the, these are not precise. Uh, they pretend to be precise. They try to be precise, mm -hmm. but it's hard. Um, so we had a real shift. Mm -hmm. Then we also changed the shape of the economy. Mm -hmm. So, and now let me just remind our audience, we're walking you through the consequences of uh, the neoliberal paradigm, which dominated both political parties and which was embraced by both Reagan and Clinton and the Bushes. Yeah. And another thing that sort of happened in the last, since, let's say, 1980-ish, mm -hmm. manufacturing as a percentage of GDP looked at what we produce, mm -hmm. declined by about 6% of GDP. 6% of GDP is a big number. It gets mm -hmm. you out one pentagon, mm -hmm. the whole darn thing. Mm -hmm. That's about, gives you a sense of size, one mm -hmm. pentagon. Mm -hmm. And we offset it by increasing the proportion of GDP by exactly the same amount of finance, insurance, and real estate transactions, the, the mm -hmm. paperwork. Complete reshaping of our economy. Mm -hmm. We've reshaped our economy many times in the past. It was always led by government policy, mm -hmm. as is typically the case. The great example was the opening of the West, mm -hmm. the transcontinental railways led by government policy, which was easy policy, because mm -hmm. first, big and good government policy is always easy, mm -hmm. because everyone kind of agrees. Mm -hmm. How you do it is where the nastiness comes in, okay? And it was easy because they didn't have to vote any money, had all that unlimited amounts of land, so we'll give you a checkerboard pattern. Um, this shaped the economy. The in the, after, in the 19th century yeah. and into the 20th century. Uh, big shaping, the growth of railways, steel, mm -hmm. all the uh, mass marketeers, Sears, uh, it, all, you know, it sort of followed. We did another round of this after World War II, the suburbanization. Mm -hmm. Made possible, enabled, planned, perhaps without knowing it, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, Morgan Insurance, mm -hmm. uh, the GI Bill, the FHA, the government guaranteed mm -hmm. loans, and the highways. Mm -hmm. The National Defense Highway Act, which ringed the cities with suburban highways. We which, used to have to call it, in case the Russians wanted to go from shopping center to shopping shop center. Shopping center. And then uh, finally the big defense budget. That is the, the great permanent defense That's budget. Right. And more recently the shift to allow mm -hmm. finance mm -hmm to really get out of the box, mm -hmm. and it did. Mm -hmm. and, and the, so, so what you're suggesting is that uh, uh, as a political economist, uh, you can see that the embrace of a paradigm was in a way a, a kind of a, 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 a statement of planning, which wasn't, put out there for everybody to see, but, but the, the consequences were it shaped our economy in the future. If you think about things this way, you'll yeah. do things that way. Yeah. Well, yeah. if you're gonna go do things that way, well, you have someone who has to sit there and say, well, if you do this, you're gonna get this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you're gonna get that. Mm -hmm. So we borrow all this money from China. Mm -hmm. The average American family goes deeper and deeper into debt. Right. Because his income's going nowhere. Mm -hmm. And we're consuming more and more. 
and all this goes through the banking system. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the banks are making a lot of money on everybody's debt as they go into debt. Sure. Yeah. And, um, you know, on one side, it's pretty straightforward. The Chinese factory makes some stuff. Mm -hmm. Walmart gets it, puts it on their shelf. Done. Mm -hmm. well, we simple. are not making that product, presumably, in theory. Yeah. A, or anymore. Yeah. Or less and less. Yeah. Or it's being squeezed. And you're seeing it, you know, that, that is that 6%. Because the manufacturing declined by 6% of GDP on the side of what we produce, not on the side of what we consume. Mm -hmm. That didn't change very mm -hmm. much. We still get the grotesque number of T-shirts, the cars, mm -hmm. the fuel. So it's just coming in. Mm -hmm. So that didn't change. It's not like manufacturing right. went away out of the earth. It went away geographically. Mm -hmm. um, now, what we did with this borrowed money, what we put in place of the manufactured jobs, was our doing. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. We could have put it into any number of worthwhile endeavors. Mm -hmm. Health. Or into energy technology. Uh, yes, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we didn't. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in, in looking at this, what we, we, we embrace in a bipartisan way, uh, a view of, of what our policy should be that, that decrees an unfettered market and, a, I think you say in the book, a fettered government. Mm -hmm. we, the government ties its hands and Greenspan brings out the punch bowl. And uh, by that we mean, the, you know, it's a free market, both globally and nationally. And you're, you're telling us in, uh, in this book and now that the consequences were, over time, greater inequality, uh, if not a consequence, it, it, it followed along with this, a, a bloating of the financial sector uh, without our sort of consciously doing this. Uh, yeah, and it nobody being, took a chart and said, we're going to have such yeah, a... Right. But, but it would, and then the third thing was the uh, helping, pushing along, furthering uh, the, the Chinese emergence as an economic superpower because they became the place where products were made and they, to protect their own economy, they saved the money and began loaning it to us yep. as we spent more than we made. In a way, it's more of an intimate embrace that nobody mm. wants. The US, mm. Let's take the U.S. and China. Um, we owe them two trillion bucks, maybe even more. Okay, they call up, they want it. We say, no problem. Do you want it in $100 bills or 20s? <laughs> we'll fill an aircraft carrier with it and send it out. Mm -hmm. So there's no way they can get their money back. Um, there's no way we can pay it. It's like 20,000 bucks per household. Mm -hmm. So there we are, we're stuck with each other. They need us because they've built their economy to be export-led. Um, were they crazy to do this? And they get this money they can't use. Now, they could use it. They could buy all their cars here. But this would uh, wreck hell on their auto and steel industries and so forth. They don't want to do that. This was a little the way Keynes explained the economic consequences of the Versailles Treaty. The French and British said the Germans are going to pay us back. And he said, how? Do you want steel? You want cars? No, 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 no. We want. Doesn't work. Um, but were they crazy? And I don't think so. I don't think so. Their intention, their goal, and I think they realized their goal beyond their wildest dreams was to learn how to make things. You had a nation of peasants really poor peasants. I don't think Americans understand <laughs> how poor a poor peasant is. Um, 
bowl of rice? Do you have electricity? Probably not, <laughs> and so forth. So, so by exporting and protecting yourself uh, from a situation where you're forced to devalue your currency, you continue to industrialize, you're converting more and more of these peasants into workers, working in the city, you're producing more and more goods, you're learning how to manufacture. You uh, get to learn how to do it. Right. You know, we're in a university, it's expensive. Learning yeah. is expensive. This was the machine. They had the nation to pay, so they couldn't produce large amounts of consumer goods for their own country because there was no one to buy it. Mm -hmm. these, there was no buying power there. And you know, these dollars are probably, they could be useful. They're not altogether wasted. Um, so they got to get good and therefore powerful at production. And they, they in this, under this uh, formula, they need to sell these products and they're, and then we get the result you already described, namely they make all these dollars, but they want to keep them far away, so to speak, and hence the development of the enormous power of their sovereign fund. That sort of thing, yeah. So they have all this money and balances and they got to do something with it. And it, you know, some of the things are obvious. Um, they'll buy a lot of, what do you do with it? Okay, they keep buying American government. Treasury bills, Fannie Mae's. That's one of the reasons the government ran in and said, okay, we're covering Fannie Mae. Mm -hmm. Because it was China. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, another thing they will necessarily do is buy American and foreign uh, companies around the world mm -hmm. because you get something for it. Doubly, maybe you get more than you just bought that company for. You may be able to bring home what it does best. And root that at home and move up the technology and competence ladder. And you get power. Or viewed the other way, America has had the money ah, for about 100 years. And um, after the war, certainly, we had all the money. Everybody owed us money. Now we are the world's biggest debtor. And there is no number two, and there's no number three, and there's no number four, and no number six, and then you get Argentina and a few other <laughs> basket cases. We're, we're it. We owe everybody tons, and some people a really great tonnage. Now, we used to use the money. When we were making it and had the money. Uh, we still think we do. Mm -hmm. You know, we haven't realized much of this. And um, we always used it for the good of the world but it was we who defined what was good for the world. So when the French and British, I think it was in 1956, sent some troops into Suez to tell that fellow NASA, straighten him out about the Suez Canal and to act properly, Ike, whom no one ever accused of being a pinko, right? Ike's okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, said, <coughs> he kind of hinted that he might cough to hint that they might hint to dink the sterling and the franc, and on mm -hmm. the spot, out they came. So we had the money. We used it as a lever. We used it to support the electoral pro prospects of various parties in, in Italy, let's say, against other parties in Italy who we thought would be less good for the maturation of democracy, in which I think we were quite right. Um, we used it. And it also gave us soft power, you suggested. It was the basis of our soft power, mm -hmm. and we were the example to the world. So we had this very wonderful kind of soft power where people do like we do. They kind of imitate our ways, our institutions, our mannerisms, and you don't have to tell them to, they want to. And um, this is something the English enjoy truly. <laughs> they came up with this great story of the gentleman, who was a mixture of a medieval knight, <laughs> a Scottish miser, uh, this and that, and uh, okay. And they invented these activities. 
sports, organized sports, all of them. They all tennis, uh, soccer, uh, all of them. The whole idea of organizing it came out of England. The whole way of being and doing, dressing. You know, if you look at a photo of uh, the late 18th century, you know, the, the court of Louis, uh, they were dressed in glorious blue and red and green silks with wigs, and everybody was. Then you got the shift where England became unquestionably the power, and it was commercial England. The whole world is suddenly dressed in drab gray, the same suit we still wear. The collar goes up and down a little, in and out a little. Um, we took some of the starch out, but um, in every domain, you see the power of this, the ascendant, the dominant the society. Now, the economy is the big engine of that, but this other stuff lasts. The other, you know, even after the reason for it, you carry on. So we have had an enormous influence. Um, all around the world, God save us all, the young people have the body language of American teenagers. They listen to it. <laughs> so so let, let, let's take this, this analysis another step as you do in the book, because what, what you're, you're really saying is that our paradigm, the neoliberal paradigm, led, to, uh, uh, led us to really change who we were. Uh, in, in, a, in an important respect. But it also led to a change in the balance of power mm -hmm. between states. And uh, the creation of these sovereign funds. And, and I think the next step in your analysis is to say, well, wait a minute, this is all coming about and what is emerging is a different view of the relation of the state to the economy especially in these places, which are the holder of the sovereign funds. And you're raising a question about, will they uh, be able to capture the innovation uh, and the ability to innovate, which comes with having money and being able to buy companies, to have uh, foreign facilities in your own country. The next big question is, how far will they be able to take that? You're, I think you've got it. I think that's an essential question. Certainly, having the money helps. Mm -hmm. And you know, you and I form this clever startup. Oh, our investor comes from some Chinese company, maybe partnered with an, an American private equity thing, but the Chinese company is borrowing unbelievable amounts of money from the bank which itself is borrowing unbelievable amounts of money from the Chinese government. So that's that same fund coming through a few stops, comes here, they invest in our technology, and they, our investor says, hey, we're going, go, 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 go next. You need more money. You know, we could really do this well if we move, keep you guys here and have forward thinking. We move some of the stuff back to Shanghai where we can get it cheaper, better, blah, blah, blah. And that's one very likely sort of thing. Um, also, what the next round of innovation is going to be, nobody knows. But yes, people do know. You don't know specific things, but you know energy technology. Everyone knows that. Well, we're not doing very well. I mean, every one of our politicians explains that we are a world leader. We are always a world leader. We're not. We're a pathetic follower. We certainly don't have much of an installed base. Uh, we're not leaders in making this stuff. We have a lot of very promising laboratory work. Uh, so do other people. And the disconnect between laboratory work and then you got to make it. Whereas in internet technology, there's no making it. You can sell one product or a hundred million the same. The costs are the same. You know, to produce one more copy of our software, mm -hmm. and you can automate the click. You don't have to actually <laughs> click. <laughs> um, whereas to make solar panels, you've got to make them and so forth. Um, windmills, titles, whatever, algae. Um, so now we, um, 
Could be. But thus far, we're not. Will we be? We could. I think it's entirely a political question. And for that, I um, see every reason for a certain amount of choking, heartbreaking pessimism. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this takes us full circle back to your career, in a way, and where you started. Because you told us, well, I got interested in political economy, uh, the interface between politics and economics. And uh, what, we're, what you're now telling us through the analysis in this book is that we un have to think differently about the relation of the state to the economy in this new global context, which we have partly created. And if we're, we don't, uh, we're going to be up a creek. Because, for example, in energy technology, the state is going to have to do something along the lines of what the Pentagon did uh, uh, in, during the Cold War in terms of setting the stage for us moving forward. Yeah. And my sense is that, well, you just said it, but, but let's explore this. Why are, uh, wh what do you think will make us adapt to this very different view of uh, the relationship of the state uh, to the economy? Because it, it, the state has to be, uh, you, you say we can't do planning, and we won't do it, because it's a, it's a concept that goes against our culture and our institute, then what do we do to prepare us for this world which we've created and which we're now losing in? Do you have an easier question? <laughs> uh, we did a little bit of planning, maybe enough. As you said, um, we had this thing called the Pentagon. And the nice thing about the Pentagon <clears throat> was it was like brackets in economic thinking. You could think up to the bracket and after, but you're not allowed to think about what's going on there. It's off the table for economic thinking. And a lot of it was just a huge waste. I mean, a colossal waste. Some of it was vital to save ourselves and the world. And some of it, a small part, was America's industrial policy. We didn't call it industrial policy. You know, picking winners. We called it military policy. And this would be through Jet energy. planes, no. for instance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Commercial jet planes. Uh, I remember the Boeing 707 was the well, some of the Europeans used to argue that mm -hmm. the Boeing 707 was the K-135 military tanker with mm -hmm. windows. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it really was. And it came down the same assembly line using the same fantastic machine tools that could sculpt the Brancusi statue in 12-dimensional space with the big jet engines that had been developed huge cost and technology and needed special metallurgy. That gave us the undisputed lead in this guy. Satellite technology. Do you know of a guy in Silicon Valley who could put that out? No. You can't do those in a garage. Um, a whole raft. Of the internet. Its maiden name, as you will remember, was the DARPA net. The good folks at DARPA said, what happened if the Ruskies nuke Chicago? <laughs> we have to communicate. Right? They created a, a, a communication system with a, no central node or nodes. And then it grew to um, computing. Everyone remembers the first computers filled a room 10 times the size of this and needed 50 people to change the bulbs. Who on God's earth would buy one of these babies? And that is the seed corn of the round of innovation that propelled our economy for a long time. It was the government picking it's not so hard to pick winners if you, you know, some of these things, it's in that which particular model is a different story. But getting things going in that direction, yeah. Now, uh, let's talk a little about the Obama administration in its first year, because uh, he was elected with a lot of hope about the way he could change things. And, and if we look at uh, uh, his... 
policy. I disagree with you. Oh, okay. He was elected less with hope than with desperation at what W. Bush and company had done to smash, to destroy this great country. And they did a hell of a job. I mean, you name the dimension from the big one, our role in the, as the leader of the world, we became somehow the bad guy of the world. Our role as rich, we ended up with a beggar's bowl. Our role is let them see us. They saw New Orleans. They saw Abu Ghraib. Even the small things like environment, so to speak, but whatever it was, they destroyed it. Um, through a combination of ideology and pure cynicism. So yeah, people turn to this guy. Please, they gave him a Nobel Prize f for being alive. <laughs> <laughs> and being elected, I guess. Uh, for, for, for replacing that. Yeah. Oh, please, please bring us back the United States we've known and loved. The world needs the United States. It's not sure it's gonna get it. So if he, let's, let's accept what you're saying, if he was elected out of d desperation, do, are we seeing evidence that he can move us uh, in the area of recognizing some of the problems that you've identified? And uh, in, in particular, the changing role of the state as it deals with this series of problems. And this seems to be very much related to the way the banks are treated, basically, uh, in light of the disaster uh, that came about in, in last year's uh, uh, financial crisis. Uh, because in a way, what you're telling us is that the, the banking sector grew from 14% to 21%, and with that came a lot of power to influence elections and campaigns and so on. Is that going to change? And what will it take to change that? Because it, it would seem that there are two problems here. One is preparing for this future that is upon us with the development of the sovereign funds where the state has to play a greater role. But the other is to, to uh, putting, uh, putting the banking sector in place, in its place. I think you've got it right. So why ask me? Well, I don't know. Um, look, we did this health care reform. I cannot explain it to myself, let alone to a student. It's a jujitsu. A bit. It's a, mm. Why is it so complicated? Remember, there are other countries on Earth. All the others mm. have health care systems that work better than ours. All the rich countries. Okay, let's, I'm not talking about Bangladesh. Switzerland that has private guys. France that has both, um, Scandinavia, and they all have better numbers at much less cost, much less cost. Um, we are doing this health reform, but in order to preserve the health insurance companies and a few other, we are doing this banking reform, maybe bailout reform, maybe in order to preserve, why preserve it? I, I'm perhaps, you know, too foolish and I don't understand. It's my ignorance why I have to preserve the health insurers that gobble up everything, make everybody's life a misery. If you've ever had, God forbid, some medical, it, it's a nightmare. While you're crying your heart out, <laughs> you have to deal with these refusal and change of service, and your doctor has to, is a, not in this group, and his not in that. It is ridiculous. It is painful. It is wasteful. Well, gee, everybody in the country knows that. So why don't we change it? Well, maybe we're, you know, when you watch countries who get into trouble, it's always political. The cause of the bad economy is political. And, and that, I guess, is what the economists are afraid to admit or don't have the the analytic skills to admit it? Neither, it's outside of their domain. Mm -hmm. That's the next office over there. We don't do that. We don't do political. 
But, you know, if we got the political house in order, then the economic stuff could, you know, th there's a lot of really good work. But right now, the problem is rooted in the political side. And I think you're suggesting that the paradigm, the neoliberal paradigm, has collapsed, but that may not be recognized. Because one of the refreshing things about your book, uh, I thought, was that it, it linked this collapse to choices that were made several decades ago by both parties. And, and we're really not ready to admit that. I, don't, I think you're quite correct. I think we're going to... The patient is not dead. We've got him out of intensive care. He's still in the room there running us $5,000 a day mm. bleeding. We're going to have a, uh, it seems to me, another go at it. At the neoliberal, uh, uh, yeah. Look, look what's going on in, in the finance sector. Back to go. Mm. What's going on in the health sector? Back to go. Well, that's two big hunks of everything. Um, so we seem unable. Now you think what can change it is a crisis. You know, not going to change it because you or I or even the president says, hey, we really ought to change this. So a crisis. And Maybe the right, what we may come to think of the tragedy of Obama is he was elected a year too early. Remember, Roosevelt was elected in 32 election, November. He took office, was it March? The crisis starts in 29. Hmm. By the time the election came around, it was a disaster. And by the time he kept, and even he said, you, you know, you want to work with me? Well, I said, no, no. He, it really was a disaster. So, uh, Mr. Roosevelt, do whatever you want. Please do something. Obama came in. It hadn't gotten bad enough. And, and the other thing, to further your point, is that enough was done to make it not uh, bad enough for the, the world that, that Roosevelt inherited. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure we're going to make any real changes. And if we don't, of course, um, we're in even worse trouble. That, I think goes without saying. Well, on that pessig... Yes, pes there we go. Yeah. You no, know, it's economics, that yeah. dismal... <laughs> the dismal science. So, so uh, I want to thank you for being uh, our guest, Steve, and I want to recommend very strongly your new book, uh, which you wrote with uh, Brad DeLong, The End of Influence, because... It is well written. It's 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 not a long book, but it really lays out uh, the crisis we're in. But looking at it in such a way that we we see the broad picture. So thank well, you thank very you much her. for the book, and thank you mu very much for being on our program. It was a pleasure. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. <laughs>